because this is a <laughs> this is a difficult. Sorry, he's just knocked over his coffee. Don't worry. It's um, this is a difficult subject, and um, those of us who've spoken to this point have done so whilst wrestling with the topic and the scriptures around it. All right, so. Father God, we thank you for Bob and we pray for him now that through your Holy Spirit, he would enable us to understand something more of our climate crisis. And be with us also, Lord, each one of us sat in our different homes, that we may be receptive to your message and your word. In Jesus' name, mm -hmm. amen. Amen. Thanks, thank you, Mike. I'm going to take off my mask now. Well, this morning we are going to continue with our series on the book of Job, looking at particularly the issues of climate change. The last three sermons laid a great foundation on what climate change is and its negative effects on this planet Earth. It is absurd that the negative impact, impact of those changes is more severe in those developing worlds that have got lesser contribution to polluting the environment compared to the more developed economies. Coming from Uganda myself, which is going through a shameful, disheartening abuse of human rights by those in power after presidential election, which yielded unjustifiable results. It is utterly disrespectful and demeaning to see that in the 21st century, instead of the government concentrating on the well-being of its citizens, it is instead abusing the human rights of its own, who have actually the right for fairness and justice. I condemn the injustices happening upon the people of Uganda and call upon all stakeholders to intervene in this situation immediately before it is too late. You know, be besides all that is happening in the same nation, the impact of climate change, friends, is real. It's continuing to affect the most vulnerable as the rich and those in power continue to embezzle, exploit, the resources that God has blessed all to benefit from. So it's shameful to see what is happening in Uganda in particular, but also other nations as well. Friends, the unjust ways of man not only are destroying man himself, but also affecting the whole ecological system around the world. Think of the use of tear gas. We see governments and police brutalities, using a lot of tear gas. Its long-term effects on the surrounding environment is devastating, let alone on the health of human beings. You know, the selfish nature of man has led to dominance, arrogance, and abuse of creation. The gospel of Mark likens this to the seed or the word sown among thorns in Mark 4, 19. Now, today's reading is in the book of Job, 38 from verses 1 to 11. I'll quickly go through it. Job 38, if you have your Bible with you there, please join me in reading it from verses 1 to 11. Then the Lord spoke to Job out of the storm he said, who is this that obscures my plans with words without knowledge? Breast yourself like a man, I will question you, and you shall answer me. Where were you when I laid the earth's foundation? Tell me, if you understand who marked off its dimensions, surely you know. Who stretched a measuring lines across it? On what were its footing set? Or who laid its cornerstone? while the morning stars sang together and all the angels shouted for joy. Who shut up the sea behind doors when it burst forth from the womb? 
when I made the clouds its garment and wrapped it in thick darkness, when I fixed limits for it and set it doors and bars in place, when I said, this fire you may come and no further, here is where your proud waves hold. And I'll quickly read another passage that I will be looking into um, this morning as well. That is Genesis um, Genesis 1, 27 uh, to 28. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him male and female. He created them and God blessed them. And God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over every living thing that moves on the earth. You know, the book of Job can inform us in the ways we face the challenges of climate change. As we look at the book of Job, I am going to take you on a journey that will form some of the ways we can face the challenges of the issue of climate change. And this journey will comprise of three stops. So our first stop is called the place as it was meant to be. Mark that, the place as it was meant to be. At this top, we will learn that God's creation was beautiful, magnificent, wonderful, glorious, stunning. And then we will also learn that humans actually, in this beautiful, glorious place, are not at the center of God's creation. Instead, Humans are part of the creation of the creation, created world. Stop number two is the place I do not want to be. That place you do not want to be. I don't want to be. And the question here is, oops, what have we done? We must be responsible for this place. And the last one is the place I long to be. The place I long to be. The key point here is stewardship of creation, looking after the creation. What can we do? What can you do? It's a question of responsibility, dominion, and stewardship. So look, let's quickly look at the first one. A place as it was meant to be. Now, that is a reminder that we humans are just part of the big creation story. The knowledge and intentions of the creator at this stage is paramount in the ways we care for creation around us. First and foremost, we remember that in the book of Job, if you remember the story, Job was a wealthy man who later lost everything he had ever possessed. His wealth and family, yet he did not lose his faith. He still believed in God. However, Due to the terrible situation he was going through, he questioned God, asking why he was being punished through his suffering when he did nothing wrong. Sometimes when I look at the devastating effects of climate change, it feels the same. I'm tempted to blame God for what is happening. But God is gracious God, who is gracious, compassionate, slow to anger, and rich in love, responded not to the question of Job's suffering, but with a long poetic speech, detailing the wonders of the universe and describing the marvelous of its creation before humans were made. In other words, God is first and foremost diverting Job's blame back to himself, exposing his ignorance of the created world. He's calling Job to self-examine, but more so, look at the creator. So in his self-examination, he should look at the creator and see the works of his hands, the beauty that lies before him. Friends, when we do not understand the value of a thing, oftentimes the not we end up misusing it or abusing it. So Job was sure that his speeches had been filled with wisdom and knowledge. But God's first question put an end to that delusion. 
Who is this that darkens my counsel with words without knowledge? God is asking Job. The Living Bible paraphrases it like this. It says, why are you using your ignorance to deny my providence? God didn't question Job's integrity or sincerity. He only questioned Job's ability to explain the ways of God in the world. In chapter, um, in chapter 42, verse 7, Job had spoken the truth about God, but this, his speeches had lacked humility. Job thought he knew about God, but he didn't realize how much he didn't know about God. It's always important, friends, to remember in all we do that knowledge of our own ignorance is the first step towards true wisdom. The issue of climate change calls for humility. We have to be humble. Friends, in order to tackle the issue of climate change, we must have, first of all, the knowledge of God as the creator and the knowledge that he provides to us through science. God began with the creation of the earth and compared himself to a builder who surveys the site Marks of the dimensions, pours the footings, lays the cornerstone and erects the structure. Creation was so wonderful, beautiful, that the stars sang in the chorus and the angels shouted for joy. He even said to Job, ask the beasts and they will teach you. The birds of the heavens and they will tell you. All the bushes of the earth and they will teach you. And the fish of the sea will declare to you, who among all these does not know that the hand of the Lord has done this? The psalmist says, when I consider thy heavens, the work of thy fingers, the moon and the stars which thou hast ordained, what is mankind that you are mindful of them? Human beings that you care for them. For the psalmist it leads him to worship, leads him to the maker, the creator. Sir David Attenborough says, it seems to me that the natural world is the greatest source of excitement, the greatest source of visual beauty, the greatest source of intellectual interest. It is the greatest source of so much in life that makes life worth living. The beauty of creation reminds us of the creator, Yahweh. You know, I'm always blown away by the beauty and the splendor, the detail and the order of creation. Every time I visit places, I don't know about you. And when I have watched documentaries by Sir Alex, I mean Sir David Attenborough, those beauties often point me back to the creator himself and launches me in awe and worship. This is the place as it was meant to be. Isn't that marvelous? That's the place as it was meant to be. The bad news is that that place is deteriorating quickly due to human activities. This leads us into the second stop, the place I do not want to be. The question here is, oops, what have we done? Unfortunately, it's the place we are in right now. It's marked by greed and sustainable consumption that benefits a wealthy few while leaving the majority of the earth's people poor. It's a place where many species of living things are disappearing, a place where seasons have changed, a place where air pollution is at its peak, a place where underground water sources have been contaminated. You know, man in his selfishness is wasting natural resources, polluting land, air, water, and outer space, and so ravaging God's creation. This is not the place I want to be. Is that a place you want to be? Me? No, I don't want to be in this kind of place. Not only that, but we have also ended up, unfortunately, ignoring God's other directives for love, honor, and justice. A place I wouldn't want my children and grandchildren to live in. 
In a book, Comforting the Wild Wind, God, Job, and the Scale of Creation, the author, Bill McKibben, says that conventional wisdom tells us that a growing economy is a sign that we are doing things right and happiness comes through material consumption. But the Christian faith teaches us that the true mark of the good life is an understanding of transcendent joy and the humble recognition that we are stewards of creation rather than masters over it. I often forget that I really do not need much to be happy. I don't. What I have is enough and I'm able to share it with others. And when I share that, it always gives me great joy. We need to share. We need to come to a place of recognizing that actually what you have is enough. But the national tendency is to yearn for more and more. The latest phone, the newest shoes, you know, latest gadgets. That's the temptation I always have. And, and I'm sure most of you might um, agree with this. But if you assess self, isn't what you have really enough for you at this moment? I'll leave it to you. And I'll, I'll continue to assess myself too. Now, this brings us to the last stop, the place I long to be, the place I long to be. And the, the question here is, what can we do? What can you do? What can us together, collectively do? It's a question of responsibility, which can also refer to as, we can refer to as stewardship. In verses 8 to 11, God describes caring for the mighty sea as if it were an infant, clothing it with clouds. Some people claim that actually this is likely to be a reference to the horizon line on a cloudy day when it looks as if the clouds are touching the sea. If you have been to the seafront, you might have seen that for yourself. From the beginning, friends, God planned his creation to be a garden of joyful beauty. Unfortunately, sin has turned creation into a battlefield of ugliness and misery. So, what must we do? What must you do? The scripture emphasizes two themes regarding the role of humans in relation to rest of the creation, dominion and stewardship. And both refer to the inescapable fact that humans live in relationship to created order, first as creatures of the created order ourselves, and second as caretakers of all creation. Both roles are naturally intertwined. In the book of Genesis, God gives human beings an active and powerful role. Humans are granted authority over all other parts of the creation as the unique bearers of God's image. We are given dominion, the privilege and responsibility to rule over creation. While misunderstanding of this concept has led to some very poor thinking about how humanity is to interact with creation, the exercise of dominion is clearly part of God's intention for humanity. God tasks humanity, he tasks us to govern and supervise the rest of creation by exercising dominion. But wait a minute, what does having dominion really mean? It's a very important thing to remember here. Now, the Hebrew word for have dominion in Genesis 1.26 is reda. A study of the verb in itself reveals that it must be understood in terms of caregiving, even nurturing, not exploitation. Therefore, because we are in the image of God, we are to seek to relate to the rest of creation as God relates to us. I hope that makes sense. We are to be attentive 
to work the earth in a way that is so, is too to its benefit. Now, human is to interact with creation to exercise dominion clearly part of God's intention for humanity. Okay, so let's look at another point here. God gave dominion as a means of blessing for both humanity and for the rest of creation. It's our God-given task. We've been given dominion to honor God and to care for our neighbors. Through dominion, we will fulfill what Jesus himself identifies as the greatest commandment, to love the Lord with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength, and to love our neighbors as ourselves. We care for the earth because it is naturally linked to the well-being of our neighbors. It is not loving, if you know, to our neighbors if our activities put contaminants in water and pollutants in the air threatening our neighbors' well-being. It's not loving at all. Another reason God gives us dominion is because God knows it is good for us to be in nature. God knows it's good for us to look out over the plains and savannas, sit beside a peaceful lake, stand on the shores of great oceans and walk through mighty mountains. In these activities, we are humbled by the greatness of the Creator. We draw closer to God. And this brings us peace and deep joy. So what are some of the practical ways we can actually be good stewards? Personally, I used not to take the issue of climate change seriously. Though I knew that I'm responsible for the care of the world I live in, my wife has taught me a lot about this topic and how important it is to be taken seriously. She's always challenging my thoughts on climate change and I've grown, my perceptions have changed. Where I come from, in my village, fortunately my grandfather planted a lot of trees and forests and we've, as a family, have continued to take care of that and we have, we've planted more of trees. Maybe you can, um, do something similar by supporting organization looking after, I mean, planting trees. I know of organization that are planting trees all over the world. But really, today, I'm not going to ask you to particularly look outside, but rather focus on yourself, maybe your household, and ask the question, how are we being good stewards of our environment, of the climate, starting from your own household? Maybe you can consider doing less driving and instead walk or cycle. I don't know. I'll leave that to you. Maybe being so mindful of the effectiveness of re your recycling Think about those things. These are small things that have great impacts. Think about them as a family. As a church, we are using recycle bins more. We are limiting printing and the use of papers. We, uh, we will be looking into avoiding using non-recyclable cups and plates. We've joined, uh, we've signed up and joined Eco-Friendly Church, which will help us to assess the situation at hand and continue to improve. So again, through you guys, continue to challenge us so that together we can actually take this issue of climate change seriously. But it starts with you and me. May the good Lord help us as we continue to recognize that he is mighty, powerful, and because we love him, because we worship him, because we work alongside him, that we will be responsible and take care of what he has granted us. God bless you and keep you.